Well, welcome everybody. My name is David Angel. I'm Clark's president. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture. We'll focus really on the topic of Chinese culture and education. We're very delighted to have Lisa Wong, um, the mayor of Fitchburg, with us as our speaker. I'll introduce Lisa in a moment. This is actually a, uh, an interesting time on, on all American campuses around the question of our relationship to China and Chinese history and Chinese culture. Clark, like many institutions, is exploring ways in which we can um, deepen the educational opportunities for our students in China, but at the same time, uh, make the educational resources of our university available to students from China. Uh, we have many students from China on our campus today, particularly in our graduate programs, and Welcome those of you who are here today to, to our lecture. Um, but we're also exploring our new partnerships. I'm just back from China myself with Dean Massey, where we have been finalizing a series of agreements with universities in Shandong province that will both allow Clark to offer graduate degrees in China, but will also create more opportunities for Chinese students to come to the United States. We're, we're particularly excited actually about a couple of different things. One is the possibility of creating what in our jargon we call reverse study abroad options for Chinese students. Now, Americans have had this long standing tradition of spending the summer or the junior year uh, abroad in another country. We're very interested in creating the reverse phenomena of actually inviting students from other countries to spend a semester or an academic year on our own campus, joining our classes and really enriching both the classroom experience but also the, the campus experience of having um, students and faculty from so many different backgrounds and cultures in one form or another. So um, we're very interested and excited about the um, opportunities that exist to deepen our understanding of China and, uh, and to enrich our own camp campus from that. Um, I, I have to say, uh, as, as I think about this, that this, in some ways today's lecture has been a long time in the making. I, I, I can't go much further, frankly, without recognizing Professor Paul Rock, who really, over many, many years, has been a huge advocate and supporter of the importance of the university deepening his understanding of, of not just China, but East Asia and, and, and other parts of, of Asia as well. And I want to thank you, Paul, for, for your commitment to this. <laughs> we have in, at Clark seen a really a flourishing interest, particularly in Chinese language, and I, I thank the organizers of the supporters of the afternoon's lecture in that regard. Um, but let me turn to, to our speaker, um, Mayor Lisa Wong. Um, Lisa won election as mayor of Fitchburg in 2007. Um, I think a, an event that many of the members of the Fitchburg community saw as being a really important opportunity for, for change, for fresh ideas, for fresh approaches dealing with the challenges of the mid-sized industrial city um, in, you know, in the Commonwealth. Um, mayor Wong, uh, the timing was perfect. She became mayor just at the time when the recession hit uh, <laughs> the region, and I think has faced, as, as many communities in Massachusetts, you know, really difficult and demanding challenges in terms of how you create shared and inclusive growth in a community, how you create a process that really is embracing of all members of the community, and how you set and achieve goals that improve the, uh, the lives of, of, of the members of that community. I, um, well, I haven't spent much time in Fitchburg. I have heard from many of our uh, Fitchburg friends, if I see David Roth here in the audience, uh, that um, there's been some real new ideas and, and progress. <coughs> in the community, and we're grateful for your leadership in that regard, Mayor Wong. Mayor Wong is um, particularly um, interesting for today's event in that she is the 
first female Asian American mayor elected, as, as I understand it, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So that in itself, I think, is, a, is an important event. Uh, this, the, this movement towards greater diversity and political leadership in, in the Commonwealth, I think, is a very welcome trend and something that um, we're pleased to support. Mayor Wong has, has graciously agreed to speak to us this afternoon about the relationship between education and her Chinese heritage. So please welcome Mayor Wong. Thank you, President Angel, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I first want to begin with a uh, slight uh, modification of the biography, and that is, uh, I saw the recession coming, so therefore I jumped in. <laughs> and I don't know if any of, any of you are like that, but um, I certainly like, uh, certainly if there's a time of crisis, I like to be in the driver's seat. You know, I'm not a very good backseat driver. You really don't want me sitting in the back of your car. Um, so even if we're going 80 miles an hour toward hurling towards a cliff, you know, I'm going to make a change so I can get into the, uh, the driver's seat. So I wanted to uh, really begin today's discussion with uh, just going back to roots. And what's great is, you know, I hate to say this, I don't really like PowerPoint. So I thought, but I, there's a couple pictures I want to show. So I was like, oh, I have Facebook. So some of you might have noticed, okay, there's a tab that says Lisa Wong Facebook. Is she, does she come here to just check her Facebook page? But boy, you know, can you keep a lot of information here? But this is, um, this is where it all began. And uh, can any of you pick out which one is me? <laughs> just one person? <laughs> All right, it's uh, it's the red over million. So this this is me and my two my two brothers and my mom from um, I don't know 20 years ago. No. <laughs> Actually, about 30 something years ago. I can't believe I can start to say things like that now. And this is a. Uh, this is really the formative years, okay? And anybody who studies early childhood education will tell you these are the formative years. You know, the things that you're exposed to um, at, this, at this period of time can really influence you for life. So there's a couple things you'll notice in this picture. Um, first of all, the world smiling except for me. Um, I've, <laughs> I've been uh, known to be a very serious person always looking deep in thought, and apparently I was born with that affliction. And uh, so one of the things you'll also know, there is, there is actually no TV in this room. There is no TV in the house. Uh, we actually didn't even have a lot of, um, of childhood books. You know, I go and I have uh, godchildren now, and I'm about to have a nephew very soon, and, and there's, you know, toys and books everywhere. And um, our household was was fairly fairly simple one. You know, we all actually worked at the Chinese restaurant. I started working at our Chinese restaurant when I was four. So we spent most of our time there. So that was our, our play area versus the house. But we didn't have a lot of books. We didn't have a lot of TV. And what we did for entertainment was we told stories. And we, um, when we had times like this where we could sit around, um, and those types of stories like, really influenced me. And what I remember growing up, um, you know, I, I'm like learning now, again, with all these godchildren and nephews and so on, you know, Good Night Moon, all those classic books that you, you give to children. Well, I grew up with what I consider classic and formative stories. And at this age, my parents began to tell us, because you can see my, my two other brothers were slightly older, and therefore they didn't understand what my parents were telling them. But, you know, I started getting these stories very early on about how my parents grew up and how it was very, very different from how I grew up. And I wanted to ask all of you, so how many of you in the audience were either born in a different country or have parents who were born in a different country? Okay, it's hard. Some of you are kind of shy or have short arms, so it's hard to see, but I'm going to say it looks like it's about 50%, so I, I should have raised my hand too. So when you have that, that difference of having exposure to a different country and growing up in the United States, especially in Massachusetts, um, and not that far away from Clark, so you know I was getting the brain waves from Clark University over to where I grew up in North Vancouver, Massachusetts. Um, my parents would tell us stories about how they grew up. So listening to my mom talk about how she made all of her clothes, um, listening to my dad about how they didn't have electricity, how they would explain to me about chamber pots. Have any of you used a chamber pot? So, okay, so again, we're starting to see that there's marked differences between um, how 
some people live in the world and how other people live. So very early on, my, my parents would tell me these stories. My mom grew up in Hong Kong. She grew up in uh, basically a, a very small room which was shared with three other families and she had six siblings. So you had to take turns to sleep. And when you think about that, you think, well, I have my own room. And you're in your room and you're thinking, gee, I have my own room, my own bed. And my parents are describing how this room was bigger than the room that it came from. And their entire family was there. And it was great. I mean, I loved having sleepovers, you know, in each other's rooms with my brothers. We used to, you know, play with our stuffed animals and, and make up plays. And my brother used to dress up in my nightgowns, but he's probably going to kill me for talking about that story. But he's, he's far away. He's not here. And, and you, you will never show him this tape. So, uh, but, you know... And I, we, but we used to actually talk about those things. So from an early on, we would have those stories, we would create stories, and then we would actually discuss and debate how different they were from the, from the lives that we were living. So we're, you know, we're, we're in our rooms and, and we're, we're making up these stories and um, you know, trying to play like we were growing up in a fishing village like my dad in China or um, growing up in a, in a tenement housing like my mom. And it's hard to imagine that. But from a very early on, the, the idea that lived very different lives and that we were incredibly lucky that was drilled into us very early on not by parents trying to say you know you need to know this but it was just the stories and their stories were so fascinating um, and that really affected uh, me to this day and a couple of things that happened so my brother Andy who was in the red overalls he's about a year older than me and I wanted to do everything that he did so we went to nursery school together we ended up you know, graduating together we um, we're um, you know, co-captains on, on sports teams together because we did some of the sports were co-ed. We were lifeguards together and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I wanted to do everything that he did. But there was one thing that was very interesting. So we each took different parts of the story our parents used to tell us about growing up. And it really gravitated to that early on. So in nursery school, I remember my brother, all he wanted to do was play house. So he, because he was fascinated by the idea of how the households were very different. You know, but my dad living, you know, living without electricity, my, parent, my mom living without electricity, without running water. And uh, the whole idea of like cooking and the whole idea of all these, these things we had, especially since we had a Chinese restaurant, were really fascinating to him. So I remember in nursery school, he would spend um, his time, and, and all the girls loved him. I mean, come on. <laughs> he was like, I'll cook for you, you know? <laughs> it was great. I mean, um, I mean, I mean, that continued to this day. So he really wanted to, to play house, to, to, you know, to have that American dream of the picket fence, the, you know, the dogs, the children, the good job, and so on. And he has all of that now. He has a wonderful family, a wonderful home, a wonderful life, a wonderful job. And he really wanted that from a very early age. Now, what did I want from an early age? What, what did I catch from my parents' stories? Well, I really like the story that my mom told. <clears throat> Excuse me about um, how um, her mom was uh, essentially an orphan and uh, was living with distant family and um, kind of living the life where she was sort of the house servant. Um, and she ran away from home. And she ran away with my grandfather, who was um, one of many, many children, sort of low on the totem pole. Um, and he ran away from home. And they ran away together. So they ran away to Hong Kong. I'm oversimplifying the story, but essentially they ran away. And the story is about my dad. My dad being in a fishing village, most of the uh, men in the village came to the United States, worked in uh, sweatshops or restaurants. Uh, there wasn't education. There was a, a maybe. You know, he said he thinks he's got about a fourth grade education in his village. So what did he do? He ran away. So <laughs> what I got out of these stories is everybody running away versus the home. So from a very early age, my favorite toy in nursery school was a globe, and I used to sit in the corner with this globe, you know, looking at my brother. Playing, you know, like taking turns, being everybody's husband, cooking them food. <laughs> and I would be in the corner with the globe, like spinning the globe around and just looking at all the different places um, that, uh, that my parents had been from and where they had gone. My dad in particular, when he ran away, he, thank you very much, um, one of the things he did was he, he joined the World Expo and he sold cameras. So he was able to travel all over Asia. Um, you know, pick up different languages and read everything he could get his hands on, um, watch every movie he could get his hands on, um, and you know, and that you know that type of education that he had was obviously very different from the education system that we have. So just again, sort of uh, thinking about and pointing all these places on the globe that he'd been. So I found all those places on the globe, and I hatched a plan how how I would escape nursery school and actually get to these places. It looks a lot closer on a globe. I don't know if you guys noticed that in real life. 
Um, but when you're, you know, and I was probably about, you know, in between my brother Mike and my brother Andy, you know, in nursery school. Um, so I tried to run away from nursery school so many times. Um, all that, you know, all the plastic toys, I, you know, I tried to take off the grates, like crawl through the air conditioning system. I mean, I was like this crazy person who was like trying to escape because I wanted, you know, and then everybody starts saying, oh, you know, they could, they could tunnel to China and so on. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll do that too because that's pretty easy to do. So anyway, so this, this is what I wanted early on. So from early on, I wanted to see all these places. I wanted to see these places that were different. And that, again, really shaped uh, early on where my brother Andy went and where I went. And we're, we're so close to this day, but it's just, it's so funny how we, we talk and discuss about how being that age and, and taking different parts from the stories that we heard have shaped our lives so much. So since then, um, I grew up on the North Shore. I grew up not that far away from here. Um, and I didn't try running away too often. I, I ended up sort of diving into um, a lot of the, um, I would say, the, the, the typical or prototypical um, Asian things to do. And I had, I was one of two Asian people in my class, and I swam on this regional swim team. So there was, there was actually people that I met from other surrounding communities who had the same experience. Like my friend Linda Bake, she was the, she was, she was Korean, she was on my swim team, and she was like one of two or three Asians in, in the prelim. So I started to now get a different perspective of saying, oh my god, there's like this, these other people who are um, sort of struggling with this idea of growing up um, with wonderful public education system, um, with wonderful opportunities for parents and jobs, with, with you know, basically the, the idea instilled to us that we would go to college, have careers, and so on, and that we um, were in America um, having everything that, that this country could offer and, and living the American dream. But then hearing these stories about how other people had very similar experiences and, and seeing that struggle and not sharing that struggle with your classmates because most had been born here, most had parents that were born here, some had you know great, 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 great parents were born here. My brother, um, his, his wife now, um, she grew up in the town of uh, Lee, Massachusetts. The town was named after her family. So, you know, <laughs> some people had been here. There's no Wong, Massachusetts that I know. Um, so, anyway, it's, so, you know, again, these, these sort of experiences begin to shape your life. And how it relates to education is uh, one of the things that, that I don't, and you don't quite know how it happens, but the, the sort of the Asian model minority totally played out. And you know that nobody was sort of discussing of, you know, I'm going to choose to um, have my you know, high school and public education career follow the Asian model minority model. But somehow you end up falling into that and you, you start, you know, playing certain instruments and you start, you know, playing certain sports. For me, I was a mathlete, so I was um, <laughs> captain of the math team. And I totally, thank you, David. So I, it was, it was absolutely a sport. You know, a lot of stress involved, a lot of practice involved. Um, I also, you know, swam and did tennis. But uh, that being said, you know, you start to sort of follow those models. And I actually got very much um, into trying to, to be that model minority, right? Trying to get the best grades, trying to do everything perfectly, um, trying to you know, come home after school, get my homework done so I could then go to the Chinese restaurant and uh, work there and, um, and, and so on and so forth. And then, uh, and then a couple things happened. Um, my, um, my junior year in high school, I had a teacher named uh, Mr. DeSimone. And this was my, and he inadvertently led to my first piece of political action. I didn't know it quite then. So he was a teacher, he taught English. And he was a teacher that everybody, you know, sort of, uh, they didn't like, he was very hard on everybody. You know, he, he would make everybody do public presentations, you weren't allowed to read from your notes. Um, you know, and, and he was, you know, very key on your posture, your, you know, just making sure that you did everything right. Had, you, you actually learned how to communicate, not just doing things on paper, but you actually learned how to communicate. And, you know, so he wasn't necessarily as popular as, let's say, the history teacher, who was also the football coach, who, um, you know, talked about, everything was a sports analogy. Everything was, like, related to football and, and baseball and softball, and everybody really loved that. And then there's Mr. E. Simone, you know, having us read more books than anybody wanted to read and, and give presentations and debate it, discuss it, and you know, make sure, you know, no, you know, you, that did not require any thought process, you know, think for yourself, you know. And, um, and what happened to Mr. DeSimone is he uh, ended up having an accident, and at the end of our junior year, he ended up being paralyzed from the neck down. So he had an accident, and they thought they had fixed it, and one day he woke, he 
woken up and he, had, he was paralyzed. And it was devastating for me because he was my favorite teacher to talk to. I didn't play football. I want to talk about math, you know, and I want to talk about uh, the globe, but I want to talk about literature. And um, So he was a teacher that I became very close to. And after that accident, a couple things happened. Um, first is I wanted to make damn sure that um, if we ever selected Teacher of the Year, it wasn't going to be, and no, again, all the other teachers are great, but it wasn't going to be, I would say, the same teachers, the same popular teachers based on, I would say, fairly superficial things. You know, the, I just said, but nobody ever passed an AP history test, but almost everybody passed the AP English test. And that, I think, tells you something in terms of, you know, what, where the teachers went. And so I decided that the way to do that um, was to get on yearbook, okay? And I spent three years doing swimming, you know, math, um, tennis, and so on. And I was like, how do I... How do, I, how do I become yearbook editor? You know, it's the end of my junior year. I want to be yearbook editor my senior year. You know, everybody who's, who's yearbook editor before me had, had, you know, been on yearbook since, you know, first grade or the womb and, you know, had <laughs> all this experience and so on. And I was like, I don't know the first thing about yearbook. So, um, you know, when you think about it, if you want something, what do you do? You first educate yourself. So I found out about this great thing called yearbook camp. <laughs> Anybody here go to yearbook camp? Okay, David, I actually think David taught me at yearbook camp. So, <laughs> that's probably why we both ended up in Fitchburg, I don't know. Yearbook camp people, Fitchburg. Um, so I went to yearbook camp during the summer, in addition to, you know, working at the, at the parents' restaurant and so on, because I wanted to know everything about yearbook. So that when I got back there, it didn't matter if people had 12 years of experience on yearbook, because I went to yearbook camp. I got myself informed. I knew the theories, I knew the tactics, I knew the latest software programs, I knew how to cut costs, you know, I knew to have better print quality, you know. <laughs> so when I got back my senior year, I advocated for myself and was able to become yearbook editor, which was fantastic. And that was the first step to holding a position of power where you can make key decisions that affect the whole community, right? So, and this, this is yearbook. Okay, 17 years old. So um, when that happened, that you know that that absolutely stirred something in me. Another thing was happening in parallel, which was um, Mr. De Simone's health was rapidly deteriorating. He had an 86-year-old father who was taking care of him, and uh, he decided, um, you know, he was in, in in and out of different nursing homes and, and so on for a while. He made a decision that he wanted to um, live in the projects in Haverhill, okay, which was right outside the border of North Haverhill <coughs> where I went to high school and right actually near my parents' restaurant in Haverhill. And he wanted to live there. And, you know, the housing authorities like, you can't live here. We don't have any accommodations for you. So teachers came up and they built ramps and we found out about all the software programs where you could voice activate, you know, your, your computers. And he, you know, mastered um, using the, um, the wheelchair where you, you know, you blow and you suck into and move around. He mastered all of that, and he got his wish. He moved into the projects of Haverhill, into one of the worst neighborhoods with absolutely no services around him. You know, crime was crazy, um, and and he thrived. Because what he did is he made a commitment to doing everything that he could to teach every child in that project development about everything that he was teaching us. And what was really great to see is how fascinated you know, five-year-old or seven-year-old was by what he had to say. Because I had been in his class of 16 and 17-year-olds who were, you know, sleeping, not interested, didn't want to be held accountable, yet here are these five or six or seven-year-olds who didn't have much, you know, who didn't really, weren't really sort of taught the importance of education, and they were captivated by the story. They were captivated by the message, and they weren't sort of bogged down by you know, needing to do X, Y, and Z to graduate, you know, on, on this level in order to get, you know, they weren't bogged down in that. They got enraptured by the story. And so did I. And one of the things that was reinvigorated me was the idea of traveling. Because when you discuss the Canterbury Tales and you start discussing the, these novels from faraway places with five, six, seven-year-olds, guess what they're going to do? They're going to be like we were. They're going to start asking questions about things. Yeah, this is outside of the school system. And they wanted to know, where is this? Where is that? So, what did I do? Went down to, um, I think it's called Building 19. 
Anybody know where that is? Yeah. And uh, found a bunch of globes. And got the globes and brought them over. And suddenly, you know, there's this place that, again, used to be, you know, kids were left unattended. Um, there was crime. People were scared to be out. Suddenly, you have this, you know, old English teacher in a wheelchair and this little Chinese girl, <laughs> girl handing out globes um, and making some real action happen. And I started to remember that this globe was my favorite thing. I remembered that there was a whole life outside of being the model minority citizen who was trying to get the highest GPA and you know highest grades and, and get all the AP tests and get to college and so on. And it started to, to I started to remember all the things that I had learned. You know the the book about everything you need to know you learned in kindergarten. Is that, is that what the book's called? So I started to sort of get back into that mindset. Um, and that was really. I, I mean, I, you know, I'm basically telling you a sequence of events, and um, you know, I, I'm not sure if I would have made that leap on my own. So when I, when I did go to college, things changed significantly. Um, first is I actually went to college um, in part to get out of college as quickly as possible. Um, and I don't recommend that you do that here, because if I went to Clark, I probably would want to be here for life like David. Um, but I went to BU, you know, poor Facebook, it was kind of denigrated in Facebook, but it, it's actually a pretty good school, not that far away from here. Um, and I went to BU and uh, studied economics and international relations, uh, which was very different than what I was going to study before, which was either engineering or pre-med. And that was um, what I had decided uh, when I was, before I was a junior and then, and then changed. And the reason why I had chosen those things is because I started to think about the world in terms of um, building proper frameworks to really look and evaluate uh, the world. And, you know, there's all this knowledge that you can learn. There's all these facts that you can learn. There's all these things that you can learn. But one of the most important things is that, uh, is how you look at the world. Why you look at the world the way it is. You know, what are those moral values that are instilled in you? And what are the, what's, what is the, you know, academic rigor that you've been put through so that you can be thoughtful about what you do and the decisions you make, and how you look and analyze the world around you. And I had understood that early on, because I think sometimes, again, we, we go into college and, and you know, the idea is to, again, get the best grades, get all the classwork done, check, 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 you know, I'm in chemistry, I have to do you know, biology, I have to do all these things in order to get that you know, pre-med degree, in order to then get to the good med school, and you know, that cycle. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but I was sort of surrounded by that. Especially that expectation of being, you know, again, the Asian American um, in, um, you know, going through a good school system and, and living in Massachusetts. So, um, so I said, absolutely, you know, I want to, I want to actually look at a framework for how to think. And economics is a great way uh, because it, it really studies the allocation of scarce resources, which is just about everything you can think of, uh, whether it's the words that you speak or during a given time, the, you know, the coursework that you choose over another, um, everything that you do from where you choose to, to spend your time, whether you want to, like me, sleep four hours because you want that extra four hours to do other things or choose to sleep eight hours because sleeping is the best thing. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can look at, you can use economics to really look at any, any type of issue. And then the international relations piece for me was just this big degree in, um, in, in, in having the permission to study stories um, from all over the world and all over the globe and then study those stories in the context of what I was learning in economics. So by doing those things in college, um, that really built a foundation for me moving forward. And again, is it, is it necessarily a knowledge skill set that you can now apply directly into, let's say, an engineering job or, or a job in the medicine field? No. But I had changed significantly from the experiences of working with Mr. DeSimone and wanted a good framework because I wanted to really understand you know, his outlook on the world. And I really want to get back in touch with the, uh, the types of you know, passions and ideals that I had when I was when I was a stage. So uh, when I when I got out of college, um, the first thing I did was go to Australia. And you know why? Because it was the furthest place on the globe. <laughs> and I figured I could travel there and start there. And I didn't realize that I would be going to Australia, traveling around the world, back there, and then, you know, and all around again. And those early years, um, I actually um, uh, completed my undergraduate coursework fairly early. Um, so I had a, a, a couple of years before I uh, could potentially resume the model minority path. I mean, this is actually what's going on in my head because you still have that compulsion to go back to the model minority. I thought, okay, I'm, you know, it's 19, 20 years old. I finished you know, pretty much all my undergraduate, just a couple more courses to finish my graduate degree, and 
you know, I can I can go and do what, do these things that seem very risky that nobody else around me is doing, and then you know maybe when I'm 21 or 22 I can jump back on and you know um, you know go to med school or get a law degree or something like that. So I was still sort of struggling with this, um, but I sort of knew enough about that original passion of you know getting to out of those actual places on the globe. So when I went to Australia, that was um, a very formative as well, like, you know, in terms of meeting people, um, in terms of the the, uh, the types of work and the campaigns I did, working in human rights, um, and actually seeing, again, now I was collecting stories and hearing stories and trying to understand and analyze stories from real people. Real people who had you know, come to Australia um, because of you know, issues in their, in their own country and they're seeking asylum. And then also the types of, of prejudice or the types of injustices that they faced once even coming to Australia. So uh, working in Australia, I worked on mostly issues um, surrounding death penalty in the United States, which is something that Australia uh, was working on. And I was also working on issues in Indonesia, where there was a lot of separatist movements going on, there was a lot of human rights violations going on. And it was just, you know, sort of different to think, because I don't know about you, but, you know, I had, you know, living in Massachusetts and growing up, there wasn't any separatist movements that I could think of um, that especially involved, you know, gross human rights violations and so on, and then the UN would have to step in and, and try and help. Um, but we also didn't have vast amounts of oil reserves, so maybe if we did, like Texas, we might want to actually have groups, or like Alaska, that actually do want to succeed. Um, but anyways, the, so to be exposed to that overseas, um, and to actually feel like, okay, here I am, I'm applying what I've learned, I'm making a difference, um, I'm working in the schools and the colleges in Australia and making a difference and trying to get, you know, bring people's attention to these injustices. And then through that, uh, met a lot of folks who were actually in Australia who were facing injustices in Australia. And that got me thinking about, gee, you know, that's one thing I hadn't thought about. There are, you know, here I have this, again, this sort of story, this picture, this experience of wonderful education, you know, wonderful opportunities back in the United States. But if there are, um, you know, gross violations of human rights happening in Australia, then what's going on in the United States? So um, I said, you know, that, that I think is actually the next frontier, is if I'm blind to what is happening under my own feet, you know, in the next room, in the next house, in the next town, then shame on me. Because I certainly know that there are. And I started to remember back to um, how, again, my, my wonderful um, English teacher, Mr. B. Simone, was living and you know, he used to live in this beautiful house on Maple Ave, you know, in North Andover, very, very nice. And he's like, no, I want to live, you know, in the projects in, in April. This is, this is where I want to be. And I had never seen him more happy. Um, but I also knew that he was addressing on the ground level some, some deep, deep issues that were related to policies that um, were happening you know, back, back at home. So I came back to the United States, and um, I actually was looking in Haverhill and Lawrence and other areas like that around where I grew up um, for work, for different types of community development jobs. And something opened up in Fitchburg. And it was, um, it was basically the job was, um, please come and help revitalize Fitchburg. And we have no money to pay you, so figure it out. <laughs> Like, that is so cool. <laughs> so, if anybody wants to offer me a job like that, we don't know how to pay you. It's really difficult. You probably don't want to think about it, but come anyways. Um, apparently, that would, those were the magic words for me. So, I came to Pittsburgh and I said, Well, I'll, I'll try working here for a couple months. You know, I think I can sort of swing that, see what the job is like, um, see what kinds of things there were to do. And next thing I knew, I was mayor. <laughs> well, in between there, um, you know, I discovered that there were um, wonderful parts of Fitchburg. Most of Fitchburg, I would say, is, is, is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and you would never never know, you know, given, again, the things that people typically focus on when they look at places like Fitchburg or Brockton or, or Haverhill or Lowell or any of the other um, uh, cities that are considered gateway cities. And Worcester is a gateway city. And Worcester has extreme diversity. So you have a gorgeous campus right here. This is a beautiful campus. And Clark University is actually a model for how to revitalize a neighborhood. It's actually a model for town-gown relationships and how a university, the jobs and the students here, can actually create a difference in the surrounding neighborhoods, can create educational opportunities, can raise the standards and expectations of the neighborhoods around. So in many ways, all of you are like Mr. D. Simone's being right here. But at the same time, you know, being on campus, and actually living, let's say, in a basement, um, living with multiple families. Um, and there are people here who are living without heat. 
there are people here that are living without plumbing. There was a, um, a house in Fitchburg that we found where all the plumbing was connected into the basement and not into the town sewer at all. So there are, there are issues like that that exist here. And even though it doesn't seem, you know, dealing with improper plumbing issues that create um, really bad quality of life environments for, uh, for families, again, not, not as glamorous, right? Doesn't seem as glamorous as working overseas, working on human rights issues, working on UN-sponsored campaigns, dealing with people trying to seek asylum, dealing with death penalty, you know, all of those issues. But it all went back to the core values of, you know what? The framework, the framework that I was looking at, that I had, that, you know, going back to the framework, when I'm traveling around, when I'm going to other communities, when I'm working on different campaigns, there is a difference between that and what I'm doing right now. And it's a very important difference. And it's that in many of these countries, in many of these campaigns, I'm a guest. I'm an outsider. I am somebody who has studied these things academically. I've read about them. I've done my research. I've done my homework. I've talked to people. I've had all those meetings and so on. But at the same time, it was, it was just me giving my advice about how things should be or using my voice as an amplifier for people who didn't have voices. And there's something very different about than actually being the one in the crosswires, being the one who's actually sort of in the thick of things, fighting for things, right there in your own backyard and being aware of that. And I realized if you could do that, if you could never forget both what is happening underneath your feet, but also what is happening on that furthest side of the globe, that wherever you are, you know, what's happening on that exact opposite side of the globe, then you, know, you can be somebody who can make all the difference in the world if you never forget those things. Um, there are, there's a million stories I was going to tell, but I, I, I've actually gone over my time in terms of uh, wanting to talk to you and then uh, having questions, but I did just want to just have one little vignette. Um, I found myself um, on the island of Samoa. Anybody know where Samoa is? No, Pacific. <laughs> on the way to Samoa, I got um, uh, sidetracked to Tonga because somebody on the plane had broken out in these mysterious boils, and they were like, okay, have to stay on the plane for 12 hours while we figure out if you're going to die. That was fun. But then after that, I landed in Samoa. And um, one of the things I did in Samoa is that, uh, actually, and I know I'm sort of jumping around, but uh, one of the things that I was doing as I was traveling was collecting data information um, on economic development. Um, specifically um, the idea of opportunity and a lot of that opportunity and the access had a lot to do with education. So I specifically visited a lot of um, orphanages and schools and so on. And in some in particular, I visited a, a, a school where uh, it, they considered it a college. And it was, uh, it was girls and they were 18, 19, 20, 21. Um, Thank you. Some of them spoke some broken English. It was, you know, um, and that was basically it. So communication was was not that great. But um, I remember, you know, visiting the school, and then they invited me to a picnic. It was, it was, I was like, coming here anyway. Group of people who came and uh, uh, greeted me, and then you know we had um, wonderful talk and so on. And um, we ended up going to a beach and having a picnic by the beach. And they were so excited. And I was like, you know, you're, you're in Samoa. Don't you go to the beach every day, <laughs> right? And I would. And they had never been to that beach, even though it was literally like down the cart path, um, because they hadn't left the village, and they weren't allowed to, and they were only allowed to on a special occasion with, um, with chaperones and so on to actually do that. So, you know, on the beach, you know, we're, we're having the casual conversation, and people could ask me questions and so on. And um, one person comes up to me and, and says. Um, you know, Ken, do you have, did you bring your brothers with you? Because I talked to my brothers. I said, no, I didn't bring my brothers with me. They were very far away right now. I said, why? Um, he said, well, we would like to marry them. <laughs> I thought, now you don't. <laughs> and well, I said, why? Why do you want to marry them? And they said, because in Samoa, um, you know, all the men beat the women. And if we marry your brothers, they won't beat us. And I thought to myself, you know, in terms of this, like, sophisticated concept of domestic violence is, you know, I worked on the issue here you know, in Massachusetts, and I thought, should I tell them? Should I tell them that there's domestic violence everywhere? Is there even a word? How do I even describe it? And I remember going through those things, and I chose not to say anything. I chose to sort of laugh it off and say, oh, you know, you don't want to marry my brother, or, you know, they're smelly, and they're, you know, they're not that nice. Um, 
And you know, it's, it's funny how, how even just a brief thing like that, like to this day, I don't know what the right answer is. And I don't know if any of you do too. I don't know what you would have done in that situation. Um, you know, take it, use it as a teaching moment, or or uh, you know, to tell them that there there was this issue everywhere, or to uh, you know, part of it was like I want to organize here. You know, let's organize. But you know. <laughs> wasn't very familiar with the government systems and so on. And, and again, you know, things like that sort of contribute to, um, okay, you know, great, you know, I've learned all these things, I've had all these experiences, I've learned all these frameworks. But even just a simple moment like that, sitting on a beach on a picnic, um, you know, trying to figure out how to answer this question was very, very difficult. And I found that, that sometimes that's where actually the difficult things are. So when you're mayor, guess what you have? Can you fix this right now? Can you do this? I am. My house is about to be foreclosed upon. Okay, I'm worried about the, the, the traffic in my street. You know, how do you slow down traffic? How do you, you know, again, all of these seem to be fairly simple answers. And they are really, really, really tough, especially when you have, you know, 500 coming in an email every day and all the, you know, with very little money and, and so on. It is very difficult to do. But one of the things that I am very grateful for is the sum of all my experiences, including um, the education, including the idea of knowing that there are you know, different people, different places, you know, sticking to those core values and so on. And I think one of the one of the most positive things that has happened in Fitchburg is that um, the relationship that I develop with constituents is not I will do it for you. You just tell me what you need and I will do it for you because the money isn't there. You know, again, using what I learned overseas, using what I studied, using the idea of the allocation of, of uh, limited resources. I said, all right. You know, the best thing for me is that we all, we, we figure this out together, we do this together. So there's been a huge increase in neighborhood organizations, and there's been a huge increase in people um, themselves helping to sit on boards and committees and find different ways to solve problems that are cheaper, find different ways to slow down that traffic, find different ways to realize that they have safety numbers, and they're going to get, that with, you know, the police help, we're going to get that drug dealer out of that house, and we're going to clean up that neighborhood, because that's happening. I mean, every year I've been in office, for example, um, I, I had to reduce the police department by a third. That's a lot of people, because there was a lot less to begin with. But that was just the nature of having no money. But every year I've been in office, crime has gone down. Violent crime, all, all crime, it's gone down. And that's because people have risen up, and you've under, you know, I've begun to understand the value of what people have inside of them. And I, then I sort of think back to the 10 years and all the different things that I've worked in, all the different places I've been in, and that was another piece, that was another lens that I had missed. You know, you sort of acknowledge it, you know, when you're working on death penalty issues and, and, and you know, UN sponsored, you know, votes for independence and, um, and, you know, what the oil companies were doing, what the drilling companies were doing, the mining companies, and you sort of think about these things. But again, it's, it's another thing to actually be faced with it, to be responsible for solving it, and then to sort of, you know, to sort of feel it, to sort of view things very differently. So that is what I would say is, is the biggest gift of um, my education in Fitchburg, and uh, I would now be happy to open up to uh, any questions that you have. stories to this day and how do they tell those stories? No, like in or, what language do they tell you? My parents, um, by the time I was, I would say my brother's age, they started speaking exclusively in English um, per the instruction of our local school district, something that um, I want to make sure never happens in Pittsburgh. That's, basically they said to my parents, if you don't speak English all the time, your, parent, your kids will never be successful. So only my older brother is, I would say, fairly conversant in Chinese. He's seven years older than me. By the time my brother Andy and I, who were six and seven years younger, came along, um, my parents were told by the school district to, you know, you got to tell those stories in English. So there's so there's definitely something lost in translation there. Yes. I'm curious your reaction to Rainy Claw's book about the Chinese <laughs> Um. 
Oh, that's a complicated question. <laughs> yeah, not not being a parent yet myself, um, I can. I haven't been in those shoes. You know, I haven't been a parent, and I think that that when I'm a parent, there is a lot of wisdom that will automatically come to me. <laughs> it might be the hormones, or it might just be the experience itself. Uh, but I would say, you know, my, my parents were not tiger parents at all. My mom was not a tiger mom. My mom was actually very, I, I, I actually, I still, you know, this is where, there's so, there's infinite, there's infinite experiences out there, right? So how do you, um, especially as an economist, like put the framework together to discover there's a correlation or causation between how a parent is and how a child turns out. Um, my mom was, um, I would say, open to anything early on. Um, and the, the whole idea of being the Asian model minority did not come from my parents. I actually, I, I still to say, don't quite know where it came from. It was just almost this like societal understanding that that's how you're supposed to be. Um, but my parents were, you know, as long, there's one condition. They're like, as long as you're able to take care of yourself and us when we're older, we're fine. <laughs> which, is, which is a very, you know, strong um, uh, Chinese heritage tradition that I plan on continuing and, and Nobody I know was ever going to be in, in nursing homes and so on, but there, yeah, there's an understanding that my parents will move in with me. But between you know them giving birth and to me them needing my assistance and moving in with me later on, um, they basically said that you know the world is is however you make it. You know, teach us. And I thought that that was very very powerful. Is um, that my parents um, were not that strict. They were not. You have to do this. You have to do this. You have to do this. You have to practice this many hours. You have to get this many. Grades. So when I decided that I was going to be the model minority citizen or I was going to do these things, those were of my own choice. But I could also, when I came to my own deep understanding, I could also change that. So my parents really didn't instill to me the idea of, you know, when I was going to get married or even if I should get married, what kind of job I would have, and so. But my 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 dad's a little like slightly more traditional. He was uh, he was a little weirded out by the idea of me being a politician. <laughs> Under, he's like, there's no Asian politicians. And it's a bad teaching moment. So, <laughs> actually, what happened is uh, he was just not very happy because he's like, what kind of career path is that? You know, you go from mayor to what, president? You know, no, that's hard to do. And, and he's like, what do you make? You know, how many hours do you work? Are you going to come home on Sundays and say hi to your mom? You know, so, I mean, but, but these are real things. These are his values. And um, uh, it was only when um, I won. And uh, ended up being covered by all of the Chinese newspapers, and people are, are coming to his restaurant with the Chinese newspapers. And I'm like, Dad, you know, if I was a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer, I don't think I would make the front page of the Chinese paper. <laughs> he was thrilled. He's like, Yay! <laughs> so that one, I'm over. <clears throat> yes. How, thinking about your teacher who chose to live in public housing, how do you, as mayor, encourage the growth of the people who? who live in public housing in your town? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, for me, uh, I actually have been director of a nonprofit that works in housing to help build housing, um, consult in housing projects, help develop uh, management plans for housing, veterans housing, homeless, transitional women, so on. Um, bureaucracy sucks. <laughs> and I did not know anything about bureaucracy you know, when, when Mr. Isamo went to live in the house. You know, all I knew was like, oh, they didn't want him to be there. But no, he insisted. He went there. We all helped build. We all made it this happy place. So, um, you know, what he actually went through, <laughs> what lawyers had to look at, whatever, you know, all of those things did not become apparent to me until, like, almost 10 years later when he became head of a housing nonprofit. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Um, so there's a couple things I like to do, being the sort of, efficiency model, economist type person, I, a lot of it is, is understanding the models of public housing and trying to change it to make it easier for the end goal, right? So for me, it's like, okay, all of these sort of words, terminologies, um, I need to know all that because I need to either, you know, try and beat the system, change the system, you know, use the system, whatever it is. Um, but the end goal for me is to provide overall affordable quality housing for all people and to provide the opportunity of people from going from you know, one housing to another, whether it's it's when they increase in wealth or decrease in wealth or ability to pay for housing. Um, and, you know, I'm a big fan of the model of having, um, you know, mixed income housing, where there's, again, neighborhoods where all sorts of people can live. And you never know, it's a little chaotic, it's, 
Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's where real people can come together and they're not labeled by the neighborhood they live in or their income or so on. So that's been my biggest um, uh, really push. And in Fitchburg, if any of you are looking for housing, there are a couple houses near me that you can find for under 100000 um, and they're, you know, four bedrooms, and they're, you know, beautiful Victorians and so on. So, I mean, we have plentiful affordable housing. Um, but to sort of link the housing model to other socioeconomic factors, like people's ability to pay, um, also their civic engagement in the neighborhood, those are almost as important. Um, and those are things that we've been, we've been working on. And in Fitchburg in particular, um, it, you know, we, we use statistics, you know, we use um, the code enforcement, we use, you know, public safety statistics to sort of sort of develop uh, models for where we invest our you know, municipal resources. But as a whole, I mean, it is every single neighborhood. Because I know, for example, that in, let's say, the projects, there's domestic violence. But I also know that there is domestic violence in the wealthiest areas of the city, where, in many cases, they're less likely to call the police. And that, for me, is a fundamental you know, issue that I want to solve just as badly as I want to solve the other issues. Yes. Um, what do I want to say? It's a complicated question. Why do I get tripped up over that question? Good job, everyone. Keep it up. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I guess I have to say that I'm so glad that uh, things have come a long way since my parents told uh, were told by our school district that you know the children only need to speak English at home. Um, and you know we have we have numerous children um, in our school district in Pittsburgh that uh, that don't speak English, and their parents or they speak English, and their parents don't. So um, we want to be as accommodating as possible. Um, we're working on initiatives where um, we can make sure that people are bilingual by the time they leave our public school system. And we have been looking ourselves and and um, Chinese language programs. So that's one of our particular goals. So I have actually been personally visiting uh, different Chinese language programs throughout the state. Um, and I would love to look at, at the, um, the college models, the private college models, as ways to, to do that. Because I know that uh, probably most of you are learning it for the first time. I'm not sure. I mean, did any of you study Chinese in high school or even middle school? OK, so now we, we want to try and make sure that these language programs are offered um, earlier. I also, um, you know, I'm sort of sick of hearing to like, oh, I took, you know, six years of Spanish in middle school and high school, and I can't you know, speak a sentence. So we're, we're very much about um, you know, people being able to speak the language, retain the language. And that's why we're, um, you know, we've been also focused on bringing out different cultures into the community, um, having Uruguayan festivals and Hmong festivals. And we translate things in the Hmong. Um, so for example, if an English word is like, we, we translated arts and culture, and then uh, Spanish is um, like our damn culture run, so it's not equally as long. The description for Russian culture in Hmong is like this long, because they don't have any words, so you can describe all of it. Um, but, you know, we, we do those things because we want to bring out the different cultures that we have in the community to the forefront. And I think mean, that's, that's just as important as, for example, developing programs and relationships and, and so on, you know, statistics that you can check off. Um, because there is, and you can see it in some places, you can see it on the federal level, there's certainly um, still a, um, I mean, immigration, for example, one of the hot button issues that you're seeing in all the Republican debates. So, I mean, these are all issues that we, we have to grapple with. And you can grapple with it by, again, looking at these big international issues, looking at the national issues, and you can also figure out how it actually affects what's happening right here on campus. I know um, we have been trying to expand our international program at Fitchburg State. And I don't know if there's sort of differences between a public university and a private college like Clark, um, but it's hard. The visa program is really hard. The resources available are really hard. Um, policies like uh, like the TOEFL, the TOEFL uh, scores, we're trying to get the TOEFL scores a little bit lower for undergraduates because they're the same as the graduates. And so it's really hard to get the diversity you know, here. I know that's an expansion of your, your question, but um, you know, I, you know, some people say, you know, how, how do you, 
had to mobilize the, the you know, Chinese population in Pittsburgh to become the first Asian American Chinese mayor. I said, well, I, I did talk to all 60 people, um, but I also <laughs> had to talk to 6,000 more. So, um, so we, you know, I have to represent the whole city and really bring out all cultures that we have, um, as well as prepare them for a globalized world. That's the right place to finish. Right, oh, wait, one more. Uh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, what activity did you get involved in college? And which one of the things that helped you the most in your uh, What activity did I get involved in college and what helped me the most? Well, what's most relevant now is um, I um, I had some free time, I don't know where, but I was like, oh, I'm going to go volunteer at a, at a political campaign. I had never been involved in politics before, but I had just turned 18. There's this guy named Scott Harshberger, who's the attorney general, running for governor. So I walked in his office and I said, I'd like to, you know, like stuff envelopes for Steve. They're like, who's Steve? I'm like, the guy running. They're like, it's Scott. Yeah. So I didn't know that much about what was going on. Right. So I ended up, you know, stuffing, like stuffing envelopes. And there was a, another woman who was stuffing envelopes with me. And, um, and the campaign needed a, a volunteer coordinator. And I had been volunteering for like a day. I couldn't get the candidate's name right, so they asked her if she would be the volunteer coordinator. And she did. She had been working there for a while. Uh, well, we learned a lot in that campaign. And to prove that we learned a lot, you know, not only am I mayor today, and I can tell you that I learned a lot from that election, um, but this woman that was sitting next to me, she's the deputy campaign director for Barack Obama today. Okay, so we learned a lot.